I think um, <clears throat> we have our full complement at this point and the meeting uh, can go ahead and commence unless uh, anyone has any objections. No, I think uh, Jill, do you want to just take it over for this workshop? Sure. Do we want to do a um, a roll call or maybe Nick wants to do that? No. Just so we know who's here. That's a great idea. I'm going to start with the planning commission, okay? Just because I've got those in front of me. Mr. Georges? Here. Mr. Cusero? Here. Mr. McHale? Here. Mr. Nushai? Here. Mr. Pernick? Here. Ms. Redman? Here. I don't know if I have to say I'm still in class in, but I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Sanaki. Yeah. Refer to the previous meeting. <laughs> Here. Mr. Shepard. Since I joined late in the last meeting. Here, Clawson, Michigan, Oakland County. Mr. Watson. Here. Okay, and then for City Council, we have Mayor Milan. I am here in Clawson. Councilmember Sampson. Here in Clawson. Councilmember Phillips. Aaron Clausen. And Councilmember Moffat. Aaron Clausen. All right, and on to the DDA. I'm pulling it up, but I'll try and do it off the top of my head real quick. We will start with uh, Chair uh, Mary Liz Curtin. It's out of town. Mr. Bolin. Ms. Glander. Sam Gill. Bill Kelly. Here in Clawson. Mr. M Mahmood. Hmm. Mr. Uh Rainmaker. I think Mr. Mahmood was uh, momentarily kicked out. It looks like he's rejoining. Uh, yes, apologies. That phone uh, logged off there for a second. Okay, uh, Mr. Raymaker. Ms. Riza. Ms. Ryan. And that will conclude roll call. Joan Horton's here, by the way. Yep. All right, are we all set to go? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we've got a couple of items um, to discuss today. As you saw in the agenda packet that we sent out on Friday, um, we appreciate you all coming together. Um, hopefully this will be the last time that we have to do this in this format, um, but at least we do have the ability to do it and, and be together in some fashion. Um, we have some things that the Planning Commission has been working on, including um, the zoning topic of cannabis and zoning amendments. Uh, we wanna give you a little uh, overview of capital improvement planning. Um, we had added in an item um, as requested by Council Member Sampson at the last meeting of the B1 zoning proposal. I didn't think I saw him on the call, so I'm, maybe when we get to that, if he's able to join us later. I'm, um, I'm here. Oh, you are there. Okay, good. All right. Well, then we will get to you later in our agenda. Um, a quick little update on the master plan amendment um, with a plug for our open house um, that's coming up on June 9th, which I'll tell you about again later. Um, and then an opportunity for you all to share with us um, ideas for the next time that we get together um, for another joint meeting. So as you know, um, if you've been 
following the planning commission's um, meetings and agendas, packets, um, we have been talking about creating some zoning standards for cannabis facilities. Um, we've been doing that in uh, just to be able to be proactive, um, knowing that we've got two ballot proposals uh, later this year uh, coming up um, that include general ordinance language to allow cannabis facilities. Um, these ordinances do not include zoning language. So um, the city would need to have that in place um, pretty quickly if either of those ballot initiatives pass. Um, and so again, having this language, the zoning language ready to go for the council's discussion and action um, just allows the city to be more proactive regardless of the outcome of the vote. Um, so the planning commission's been, um, and, and as you know, we talked as a group, um, it was probably over a year now ago, we talked about um, the laws relating to cannabis in Michigan. We talked about the uh, medical marijuana facilities. We talked about recreational um, marijuana facilities, the differences. Um, and then we know that this language has been before you. So we know this is not brand new information. I'm not really gonna go into much more of that background. Um, although we can, if that's needed later. Um, we do have uh, an, the general outline for the zoning standards draft that we included in your packet. Um, so in the zoning standards, we would include um, the intent. So why, we're, why we would even be um, including this language. We'd include some definitions, um, districts, where would we permit this, um, how we would permit it, where it applies, uh, separation distances and parking standards are, are some of the key things that the planning commission has been discussing over the last couple of months. So when we think about the definitions and we look at the draft, really um, we're not making anything up here um, and we're not reinventing any wheels. The, def the draft ordinance contains definitions that are consistent with state law. That just makes sense um, from all standpoints. Um, it would be then consistent with whatever general ordinance language may or may not be adopted in the future. Um, districts, so the planning commission's discussed which districts there might be, um, this might be applicable um, we've talked about the B1, B3, BRD2, I1, and Westgate, um, which really, if you look at this without the areas included in the buffer areas, the 1,000 foot buffer from schools and childcare, from places of worship, from substance abuse treatment centers and parks, really what you're left with are the areas that are colored and those correspond to the different districts. Um, so we do have uh, BRD2, we have Westgate, we have the I industrial areas here, um, the B3, there's like one little spot up here and a B1 area over here. Um, so it doesn't end up being that many um, areas within the city um, once we factor out some of the buffer areas. Um, obviously not, um, if we look at, you know, most of the city is zoned residential. So all of the yellow, all of the um, orange is multiple family. Um, so none of those areas would be permitted. And when you look at the buffer, that really removes most of downtown as well. And we know that that's consistent with the DDA's um, philosophy on this at the moment. Um, so in, again, um, the, the draft includes some of the breakdown of uh, the purpose. So why are we regulating these? Um, where would they apply? What are the pre pre review procedures? Um, we think about um, when we look at um, how we might have development review, we would consider would we permit them by right or would we permit them with a special land use? And as you may remember with special land uses that also, um, that special land uses are those uses that might be appropriate in a district, but they might not necessarily fit within every specifically zoned parcel um, that way. Now, when we look at that map again, there was not much difference between, um, there's a little bit of difference here between the BRD2, this BRD2 and this BRD2. Um, and there's a little bit of difference between this industrial and this industrial. And so that may be worth considering having this be a special land use process where we might have additional conditions related to the ordinance and the items that we've got included in there uh, to protect adjacent land uses. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, additionally, the um, draft language includes standards for 
um, separation. So again, we talked about the 1,000 foot buffer district or buffer distance. Um, and then there's some general requirements. So if we think about um, what kinds of issues the planning commissions talked about, um, the different uh, concerns that they may have or that residents might have um, or that adjacent businesses might have with some of the cannabis facilities. And so we have, you'll see in the draft language, some general requirements. So we think about um, residential uses would not be permitted in the same building. Um, we are trying to be careful of some of the negative, potential negative impacts. Um, odor is one that caught, seems to cause uh, the most um, nuisance for nearby um, residents and business owners. And so we've addressed that in the draft ordinance. Um, looking at air contamination, um, looking at storage security, hours of operation, um, and then some specific re uh, requirements if we looked at retailers or safety compliance facilities, um, but primarily with retailers. Um, and the reason for that is that we do think that if um, the city does allow retailers, that those retail storefronts should look like other retail storefronts. Um, that they shouldn't, they should be uh, well lit, they should be uh, safe and secure, um, they should be in places where other people are, so that there is still that feeling of comfort and safety. Um, and so some of the standards in the um, draft ordinance support that. Um, having said that, though, there are certain limits on signage. Um, window displays um, to protect uh, from people who may be coming by the area that may have sensitivity to that, um, potentially children that might be in the area walking by. Um, you know, we don't want it to be overly obvious, but we do want it to be a safe and welcoming uh, space. So um, we have some of those uh, provisions in here as well. And again, also some parking uh, standards. So I didn't wanna go too far into the ordinance specifically, um, but I hope that you've had a chance to take a look at that. And really what we were hoping is that that council had some time to look that over, um, that they could share some of their feedback with the planning commission um, so that the planning commission will um, be able to make some modifications as necessary. Um, this is not currently scheduled for a public hearing, um, although it could be in the next couple of months, we think it's probably close enough for that. Um, but really wanting to get the council to, um, to be aware of that, support it, and, and um, encourage that next step for the Planning Commission. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll leave my comments there, and then I'll let, um, I don't know if, um, Glenn, as the Planning Commission Chairman, do you have anything else you want to add to this, what we've talked about so far? No, other than obviously, if you have any further questions as far as what we've discussed, I think we've gone in length since I think it was first brought up in August of last year. Um, and I think you've done a, a very thorough job uh, as far as covering the basis on this. Um, we understand how we got here and what's in front of us. And you know, certainly as far as timing, that's critical. Um, and uh, that's something we wanna keep in mind as we move forward with this. But that's all I had. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Milan, did you have any comments or questions that you'd like to start us off with? I don't have any comments or questions, but I will say that I did enjoy that you said the parking lot area needed to be well lit. Very good. Okay. No comments. Thank you. Okay. So I, ha I have a question, um, two part. Number one, all of this information is available on the online packets for the public, right? If people want mm -hmm. to use this. Yes. And, uh, and um, part two, so I, I know that the, um, the, what precipitated all of this was the fact that we do have two ballots on, or yeah, two proposals on the ballot in November. Um, so in the offhand chance, that they both were to fail. Do we move forward with this or what's the, what's the, how do we address that? That is a very good question. And something that we've talked about at the planning commission um, and with the city attorney, I think Renis is here too, is he not? Um, there you are. Um, I think it certainly would be appropriate to have a public here. I mean, you can have the public hearing, the planning commission can make a recommendation 
and then city council can take action as, as appropriate. So whether that means you adopt it or you don't adopt it, I think that's, that's up to you at that point. Rennes, do you wanna add in on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I guess for our purposes and Jill and Joe and I and everybody else is involved who've been talking about it for some time, I guess um, you know, our, our, our you know, communal sort of two cents uh, opted for presenting council eventually with the opportunity to make that choice as to whether you do or not, that obviously will be entirely your communal will, but you should have that opportunity. Uh, there's a few different versions that this, you know, different ways that this could play out. Uh, based on the vote in November, you could have two, uh, uh, the two petitions to amend the ordinance be adopted. Uh, Rennes, I'm sorry to interrupt. You may want to lean forward just a little bit. Your audio is a bit low. Sorry, I'll speak up too. Uh, maybe that's Thank good. you. Um, so th there's a few different ways that this could, that this could play out it would come November, obviously. You could have both ordinances passed, which will, you know, trigger an interesting array of legal issues because in certain aspects, you know, in a lot of aspects, they don't necessarily coexist very well. You could have one versus the other, or you could have neither. Uh, um, uh, nonetheless, as I think, it, I don't know if Jill mentioned it now, but it, she certainly mentioned in the uh, document itself that uh, um, there's, you know, you know uh, zoning is not a part of either one of those two sets of petitions. So we need to have something ready and, and, and going uh, if the eventuality that either one of those may pass. And so I think the way the timeline works and the timeline that Jill and Joe have prepared and gone forward with is one that leads us very close to that period of time. So hopefully, you know, again, you'll consider when time comes, uh, uh, you can schedule for, uh, you can, you know, as Jill indicated, you can have the public hearing, you may choose to wait. Uh, um, yeah, it's entirely the will of council, obviously. I have a question. <laughs> Just saying that both of these ballots do not pass in the fall. That makes it a moot point. <clears throat> Is this something that we're going to go ahead and vote on anyways to have it in place in case it comes back at us? I'll add one further, you know, before Jill, you know, goes through that. Uh, uh, it may, it may it may not be a foregone conclusion that it's all over should these two petitions fail. Uh, we can, I can foresee, and I think, you know, Jill and Joe will probably agree with me. I can foresee that, uh, um, you know, petitions such as the ones that we received last year, we may receive again. I don't think it's a dead issue. I don't think, I don't anticipate it being a dead issue. I think there's enough interest. I think we all have seen this. There's enough interest in, uh, by the industry and all the players in the industry to want to be in as many locations as possible. And, and I think we, we are part of the larger scheme. So I think one way or another, we're going to have to be proactive about it. Whether you decide to do so or not is, again, certainly entirely up to you. But I think some, you know, creating the conditions so that we're not unprepared, whether now come November or even in the future beyond November, I think may make sense for a community like ours. Uh, it's a small place. Zoning regulations are, are crucially important everywhere, but particularly in a place like Clawson, uh, 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 given the way it's structured with downtown and residential areas. Thank you. If I could add. Hey, Jim, so, oh, yeah, hold on a second, John. So I just, sure. we, and again, as far as some of these discussions that we've, we've raised, in planning commission, um, you know, we have had some concern and, and we've brought up the fact that, um, as Rena said, the likelihood is that it doesn't take a lot of signatures based on the uh, 2018 uh, proposal that was passed that it'll probably come up again if it fails. Um, and it's probably gonna happen, not just to our community, to a lot of other communities. So the, the intent here is that we become prepared for this. And that was something that you know, again, you know, we've gotten to this point. We're in, and I mentioned before, timing is critical to this. Um, so we want to make sure that we get all, all inputs and everything considered that we can now, so we don't run into a problem like we have over in Madison Heights, where they have no setback uh, requirements uh, as a result of an error that on their side. 
Um, at least that's my understanding. So those are the types of things I want to make sure that we bring up and we, we can get on the table and start discussing and that, that we can vet those and make sure that we've got something that we can present to council, uh, that you have something that uh, is, is laid out as, as well as possible in order to make an informed decision. Jim, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no, no problem. Uh, just to kind of piggyback along with that, Jill, was there any other community references to set up like for the buildings, et cetera, just uh, like reference into Ferndale with the buildings that they've got like on Campbell and Nine Mile as far as um, minimum windows, et cetera, set back so far, and then they do have security guards? As far as the proposals from Ferndale, was there any model that was used? Um, we have used a variety of standards um, that we felt are appropriate for Clawson. Um, I think I think some of the things that we thought were important were did involve security. Um, we talked about this. You may remember we talked about um, yep. whether um, you know we talked about I think being having security, right, security measures other than security cameras not being visible from the public right away. So like no shutters or bars on the windows. That was something that was, I think, pretty important in terms of creating that um, exterior appearance of a place that is safe. It, it certainly should be safe. And I think that it will be with the other um, security plans that are also part of that requirement. Um, but really trying to focus on making the buildings appear as, um, I think, as I said, you know, as approachable um, and therefore, I think, more safe um, than necessarily having security guards out front. Um, but that's certainly something that can be discussed. Um, if that's important, um, that can be something that is discussed in there. Um, I think one of the other things that... Um, we did talk about with planning commission and I think we've talked about it um, probably the first time we talked about this together is knowing that the ballot initiatives are out there um, that, that there could be an opportunity for the city to be even more proactive and, and come up with something ahead of time. And I don't know Renis, if you wanna talk about that or if, if that's something that council has discussed at all, um, but just trying to think things through um, rather than necessarily waiting for um, a men for for a ballot initiative that's written by outside people, um, you know, it's my, a lot to ask of the community. I, I think, quite yeah, honestly, yeah. Um, to determine between those two if they do support having cannabis facilities in the community, and I don't know whether they do, um, but to rely on these as the choices, um, I, I just raise that as a question to council and with your city attorney's council, of course. Yeah, and, and I think actually it's a valid question and my hope had been, or at least my, in my mind, my hope had been to be able to have this conversation, this joint conversation, where that is one of those, because that is one of the options. Uh, of course, you know, the way that those two petitions came about, uh, uh, if everybody will recall, uh, the way those two petitions came about and, and the decision that council had to make at the time pursuant to our charter was an interesting one. Uh, um, it was one where council had the ability to adopt as presented you know, the petition to amend our code of ordinances to allow uh, uh, you know, marijuana, uh, the marijuana uh, businesses uh, as set forth in those two ordinances or refer them to the electorate. Council unanimously, if I recall, unanimously voted to uh, refer to the electorate both sets of petitions. And so, but I think it's incumbent upon us to present to council after we have this meeting, to present it at least as a discussion item, as, a, as an item on the agenda, to be able to at least have the consideration, have some sort of discussion, whether it's advisable to be able to, you know, advisable to, to, to accomplish exactly that. To, you know, to, to, to have a conversation about whether we want to adopt something ahead of November uh, and, and by doing so sort of, you know, and I say so lightly and with all deliberate manner to pull the rug from under the feet of what may be presented come November. Uh, 
And, and so that, that's a conversation to be had. It, pro- it, it most likely is it's reasonable that it started here and today, if anybody has, has any right. thoughts. Well, of course, we're not making a decisions today because it's not a decision-making meeting, but at least have that, you know, that, 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 that conversation and then hopefully continue it in whatever fashion, continue it in, with council in one of the regularly scheduled meetings. So can I, can I see I'm raising my hand. I have a question, comment, just thought. Um, I, should, I could do the virtual. Oh, this doesn't have the virtual hand raising, does it? Anyway, um, a, a, a couple things that I wanted to say. Number one, you know, in regard to what Mr. Nushai just said, in, um, you know, it was always at least my personal hope that um, there would be the opportunity for the council to take this issue up um, if you remember back wanting to have the sunset provision, but also, you know, encouraging people who were so inclined to want to bring it to the council to do so, although they were deterred by um, other people. But the, 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 I think that when we had the discussion, um, when the proposals were raised, we, we talked about now that there's proposals before us, it would um, fly in the face of the due process for, for, for council to try and usurp that, you know, fly in and do something before the people had a chance to vote on it. I mean, that was one of the big things is there's, although we had the public workshops and we've listened to people about whether or not they want it, we needed some sort of definitive concrete to the majority of people in class and want this. And the election was the most um, credible way to be able to measure that. Um, but back, back to, to some of the elements of the, the zone, I did have a question and about, um, and, 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 and to be honest, I didn't have a chance to copious, copiously review everything you said, it was, um, other things that are mine, but, um, the more so, the, people have the ability, caregivers have the ability to grow a certain amount under the law, right? And, and how is that? addressed in this um, regulation? If I'm a caregiver and I want to grow, is there zoning around that or is, or is that touched on at all in what you guys are proposing? It's a very good question. And um, before I even answer it, I'm going to say we didn't expect you to go through it copiously. You will have the opportunity to do that. Um, but I appreciate you at least looking at it, um, you know, giving it a cursory review so we could have our conversation. Um, this does not address the personal caregivers. Those are um, regulated separately um, per the state and this ordinance does not address that. And I'm sure Renis wants to chime in on that too. Sorry, I keep muting, I apologize. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's hand handled differently. There's several actually main bodies of law that deal with marijuana in the states, in, in the state I mean to say, and, uh, uh, and, and so, it's regulated differently. We already have them operating in the city. Uh, um, there's and there's a certain you know preemption of uh, state preemption of municipal laws or, or of city laws to, to a certain extent with respect to some of these issues. So uh, um, probably it's, it's a perfectly appropriate question. But since it's already you know, that's already in place, I think probably the focus here today should be more with respect to how we proactively deal with these other aspects covered by the MRTMA, you know, the, the latest law that we, that the state, you know, that, that the voters passed by way of referendum. Okay, I have, I have a couple question comments if I'm able. Um, are we, are we actually discussing the actual ordinance right now as well, or just around the ordinance? I just want to make sure I'm not getting a, okay. Um, well, one, I may have missed it, but I, I did thought, I did think that you were going to send us um, a copy of the actual ballot language, which I do think would be beneficial. Um, and uh, in terms of looking over the, the actual ordinance, I'm a little confused. So, in, I guess I'm asking Jill this. Um, Jill, did we did we just stick with what the state put in terms of uh, setbacks? Um, I, I didn't see anything in terms of residential setbacks or um, I didn't see any criteria in terms of limiting how many can be in one area. And um, 
I guess we can start there. Okay, those are good questions. Okay, so the um, state legislation allows the community to regulate the distance um, to schools um, primarily um, at a thousand feet, but that can be reduced and some communities have actually reduced it. Um, I believe Hazel Park has reduced it. I think maybe to, I don't know that they even have setbacks anymore for those. Um, you, you can do it from other uses as well. Um, but I suspect that if we did it for residential, that there would be nothing left for the city. And that at that point, it doesn't really seem even worthwhile to have an ordinance if you don't allow the use anywhere. Um, which I also think if you had legislation, if these ballot initiatives passed and you effectively zoned it out, I'm pretty sure that would be a problem. Um, and then the last question was, uh, I can't remember the last one, I'm well, sorry. Oh, no, well, I started off asking about the, the language of the ballot proposals. I never received yeah. one and I don't know why or if maybe I missed it in some package somewhere that came back, but, um, you know, each facility has its own type of operation and I don't see that necessarily broken down here. And I don't necessarily agree that um, all those facilities should be zoned uh, oh. without any setback. I remember the question um, was, do we have to allow all of the facilities? I think that was one of the questions that you were asking. Oh, and how many of each? And that is something that would be covered in the licensing ordinance. And I believe that's covered in the two ballot initiatives that are before, will be before the community. It is. Um, a, no, so you, want, you can, from what I understand is uh, you, that can be a part of zoning as well. Is that not, is that not true? If your licensing ordinance allows for 24 different license facility licenses, then you can't limit that by zoning. Renis? But there's different licenses in, in yes. the proposals, correct? Yes, there are. And there's different uh, there's different licensing that might be more appropriate for different areas, for mm -hmm. industrial uh, or so. I don't see a breakdown of uh, like how we might zone for particular ones and how we might even. Um, you know, limit the number of those facilities in terms of you can have four within this, you know, we're only 2.2 square miles, but mm -hmm. four within amount of, you know, miles or square feet or whatever. Um, in, in, I know that there are a lot of different cities that have zoned with a, with a residential setback. Right. So, Two things. One is in the zoning ordinance, we anticipated only cannabis retailing and this, the testing facilities. Um, I think we didn't look at um, any of the growing facilities or processing facilities because we didn't really think there was room for that specifically. Um, and we also did not address in here the limit because that is subject to change because of the licensing uh, stand that would be included in the ballot initiative. So if the ones that you are seeing in other communities is because the license permits, for example, two retailers, two processing facilities, two grow facilities and a micro business, just pulling them out of the air. Then your zoning ordinance is gonna align with that. And it'll say, you know, subject to the license, those two. And then you'll see, and for example, with the retailers, then here's where they can go. And there'll be, you know, a, a map that'll show generally the areas where they would be permitted. Um, but we don't have that in this ordinance because we don't know which one of the, um, how many numbers that will be permitted by the by the ballot, it, if either one of them. So, but don't you think that we shouldn't leave it open because then we're not putting any criteria around it. And I, wouldn't that be not getting ahead of the, the game in, <laughs> in the way that we're trying to anyway? Yes. Um, and that's something that that's exactly why we're talking about this so that we can get the feedback from from the rest of the folks here as well. Planning Commission is going to talk about it again. So we'll definitely include that and we'll make sure that we get the ballot and language to you the next time as well. Thank you.
Any other questions on that? Ed? So as part of this meeting then, um, are we asking council to give us some instructions as to information they would probably want to see and have um, basically rooted out uh, either alternatives or, or whatever? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for where we're supposed to go here today with this discussion because we have discussed it, but I, I would feel as part of the planning commission that um, I don't know what I'm being requested to do. And we would like, I think that would be helpful if we could get that direction from council to you. So as part of that in this discussion here, do we have like some bullet points of what? I think the mayor, yeah, I think Mayor Milan is trying to um, offer some comments here. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. In, in addition to turning off my machine, I am doing that. Yes. Um, I would just like to say, as council is yet to discuss this at all, I would like the opportunity to look at the information that you put together and um, not per perhaps provide direction this evening, because as far as I'm concerned, this is an informative meeting for us to see what you've been up to. I personally watched a couple of your counts, your uh, commission, sorry, planning commission meetings to see what you're doing, but I haven't followed it 100%. Uh, so again, it's not something we've discussed in the past. Uh, this is clearly a preemptive strike, strike has, been, has been discussed which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but that's just very little information for me personally to want to be able to react on at this point to also be able to provide you additional information for moving forward. So helpful, not helpful, but that's where I am on this. And I think that was, um, was at least what I was expecting to hear tonight is that we were going to answer some of your initial questions, but then council members would take this back, having the benefit of hearing from some of the planning commissioners on this, this topic, reading over some of this, and then maybe providing, as Mr. Snacky had suggested, maybe a short list or summary, or even through the city attorney some direction um, before the planning commission does any additional work on this. That sounds fair. Is there anything else anyone else wants to share? We didn't really hear from the DDA. I know that even though it doesn't, um, it's not, wouldn't necessarily be permitted in the DDA district. Um, I don't know if any of those folks had any additional comments. Joan? Uh, uh, no really additional comments. The DDA talked about this um, several meetings ago and decided that um, it was it was not a downtown business. There were other places in the city where the zoning may allow, but um, it, it did not fit in the downtown. I'm sorry, can I ask another question? <laughs> um, so I know that, you know, council back, 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 we had town halls and all that kind of stuff. But so after Council looks at it and shares whatever opinions. At, at what point where will or is there a point before or after, in conjunction with the election, that we're going to have sort of a public way in on this stuff again? Like, where how does the reaching out again to the public opinion fit in? Do we leave it to the election or do we do something else? Redis, what is the um, legal? Um, what are the provisions for that when there's something on the ballot? Can they, can council t have a town hall meeting and like, I know there's a timeline, a time buffer between informational meetings and an election like that. Is it 60 days? Yeah, I, I believe like you're asking me to go off of memory. I think it's 60 days, but you know, let's, let's not quote me on that. Uh, um, but ultimately speaking, to answer your question, at least in one direction, uh, Sue, Councilmember Moffat, uh, uh, would be to say that you can schedule the public hearing, uh, you know, as Joe was indicating, just about at any time at, at this particular point in time. Um, so, you know, and, and you can have the town hall uh, we're well in advance of, uh, 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 of, you know, the November ballot, obviously, or November election, to be able to do so at, at this point in time to solicit additional commentary. 
you can you can accomplish all that. You certainly have time right now to do so. So, Rena, does that mean that we're able to share with the um, the community the actual ballot language and a summary of what that might include for yeah. those of us that can see the petition? Yeah, to answer your question, I, I did share it. I, I, now, I don't recall what way I utilized last time, either through Jill and Joe or, or through the city administration, but we shared the ballot language. Happy to do so again. And it should be available on the city site, I hope. And if not, it, we're going to make sure that it's there. Both ballot languages are available, and we're going to make sure that, you know, wherever we store them, we store them somewhere in line so everybody can have a chance to review. Um, and, and I wasn't speaking from me. I was really meaning like a way that we can get it out to the community. Is that, okay. or is that overstepping some type of? No, no, um, no, no. I, I, I didn't mean it. Yeah, I, I didn't take it that way. And actually, both okay. me, as well as the community at large have the right and, the, and 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 actually, it makes perfect sense. It's public information. It's publicly available, and it ought to be publicly available. So, in that sense, I think, and it's necessary. It's uh, the city needs to do some you know, without sort of showing its hand one way or another it needs to do some, some uh, uh, provide some information and some education with respect to what's out there so that people are fully aware when they go to the ballot. So in that sense, it's, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, I've gone to the polls and seen proposals that I had never heard of before. So I think it would be really important um, to kind of be able to, you know, at least define uh, because there are so many different types of facilities and it's kind of a new thing for a lot of people to to have some type of way of, you know, obviously we don't want bias or anything in there, but give a general definition of what that might look like or what, you know, as, as you've done here in our packets of what, how you define those things so that you know, anybody can go there and actually see what they're voting on prior to going to vote. Or is that overstepping in some way? That's not overstepping. Like in the city. Okay. No, no, it has nothing to do with overstepping. It's just, it's public information. The city has received it. Uh, it's going to be on the ballot and you can find out about it, what it is. You, you know, it will make it accessible. There's no, there's no mystery to it. As a matter of fact, this was, if you, at this particular point in time, from this moment until we ensure through the city clerk that this stuff is put online uh, at the appropriate location, you can actually find it in the agenda by searching the agendas under the city website. Uh, it was submitted to council last, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I believe August, uh, or, or yeah, I, I don't recall the exact time, but if you search, if you do a word search on the council's agendas uh, on the city website, you'll be able to pull the language for you know, the documents for both petitions to amend the ordinance. They will be available, they will be, they will be voted on in November. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so as far as if you go back, as, um, when we first brought it up in planning commission, you just go a couple of uh, weeks at, at most prior to that, when that uh, was first brought Brought to uh, to council. Perfect. And I think that our um, the last any of the memos that we put together for planning commission, including the one that we updated for this meeting, this workshop, um, has you know kind of the last thing that you talked about, and then what you talked about before that. Um, so that's probably good to maybe keep all those things together. And then we did that. Um, presentation, I think it was last August, just sort of the informational, I don't know if you remember that, it had like, it walked through the different facility types, it walked through the different legislation. Um, so we have some, we can, I, I know it's available, we can make it easier to get to and maybe all that stuff can go together in the same spot. I think, but I think you're right. I think the more information that you can give to the community, the better it'll be um, because that can be complicated. Um, language, especially for people um, who never look at that kind of stuff. Does that require a formal direction as far as putting it on the city website in a one-stop location for that information? No, I mean, this is public information. So, you know, no, there's no, I mean, we'll, we'll make sure of it administratively. Okay. Excellent. All right. Is it anything else on that topic before I move us along? I think I see 
see anything. All right, I'm gonna move us on to So we um, were asked by uh, the city manager to put together a very, very short um, overview of capital improvement planning. Um, I've got a few just background slides to go through and then I will turn it over to him. Uh, I know he's got just a couple of comments, uh, things to add um, on the capital improvement planning and what it is. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about a capital improvement program. Um, what's required of it and how we put one together. So first of all, what is a capital improvement plan? So a capital improvement plan is a schedule of proposed improvements to the community's public facilities. Um, and so these become a list of all of the projects that the community wants to do over time. The capital improvement plan itself covers a six year period, the first year of which becomes the next year's operating and capital budget. So it should be updated annually in, in, in the uh, most cases, you've got that six year block of time. Um, when we move on, everything else moves up in the queue and then we add new projects, but not always. And we can talk about that in a minute. So some of the examples of capital improvements would be um, buildings. So city halls, courthouses, police stations, libraries facilities like parks and other infrastructure improvements like streets and roads and sidewalks, parking lots, um, underground storm and sanitary, um, street lighting, land purchases, uh, major building additions, recreation buildings. Uh, it could also include tree replacement programs and it can include, excuse me, studies and plans related to capital expenditures. Um, things that are not capital improvements would be personnel and annual facility costs, uh, minor asset maintenance, plant and tree trimming, holiday lighting, um, other repairs associated with um, some of those things like potholes or uh, gravel, um, office machines. Um, typically the community will have a certain threshold um, that will be the policy by which anything over that, um, that it's a capital purchase or a capital improvement would be included in the plan. Um, in many cases, that's $5,000. So anything above that, anything below that, um, would just be included in the operating budget. So what's required in a capital improvement plan? So interestingly, the Michigan Planning Enabling Act um, consolidated all the planning requirements back in 2008. And in there, they included a provision that the basis and procedures for the community's capital improvements program of public structures and improvements is included. And that the planning commission after adoption of a master plan shall annually prepare a capital improvements program unless the planning commission is exempted from this requirement by charter or otherwise so since 2008 communities have been slowly um, realizing that this is one of their requirements um, of their planning commission and they're moving towards um, that um, way of of managing capital improvements capital improvements have been done um, typically um, and i think probably why it got moved into the planning commission's realm, um, you know, often by administration, uh, maybe driven only by uh, DPW um, without a lot of coordination. And I think that um, including the planning commission in this um, really does some, some interesting uh, things to the process and I think prepare, uh, results in a nicer product that's more accessible to the rest of the community. So again, um, cities, villages, townships, and counties with ado adopted master plans are required to prepare it. Um, planning commission prepares it unless they are exempt. Um, so in the, um, the capital improvement plans, you really wanna have every department that's involved in the local unit of government. So that means the police, the head of police, so the police chief, um, head of DPW, finance, treasury, um, parks and recreation, um, who am I forgetting? Well, city manager, obviously, but then um, any other um, agencies or departments that have an influence and that have capital needs. Um, it's nice if you can get, if you have areas um, where you may share um, certain facilities that you might have um, adjoining units of local government involved, or possibly you'd get um, some of the um, extra jurisdictional agencies involved, like maybe the road commission um, or the drain commission, uh, excuse me, water resources commission. 
um, that may also participate um, or provide some resources and background to the community. But really it's the Planning Commission that creates and implements the Master Plan and the Planning Enabling Act recognizes that capital improvements are an important implementation tool. A lot of times when we are working with the Planning Commission, we are working on zoning as being a driver of the master plan. And in fact, you may remember, we just came to you council um, with, and the DDA knows, because we participated in too, um, is the downtown master plan and the downtown zoning changes that we had. So like that, additional opportunities to implement the master plan are through capital improvements. And the Planning Enabling Act also requires that planning commissions review and provide advisory comments on other public projects, just to ensure that they're compatible with the community's master plan. Jill. Yes. The uh, capital improvement plan that we got in this package, was it put together by the planning commission or by you guys? Well, we will get to that shortly. Okay, I got a lot of questions on it. Okay, good. All right, so preparing a capital improvement plans and, and it, well, I'll go through it. So there's a lot of background that goes into preparing a capital improvement plan. And this is funny, I don't know why this is one of the things I think is such an interesting process. I know probably a lot of people don't really get into planning capital improvements and talking about which road project and which sewer project and why can't I get sidewalks here and I need a new um, fire hose uh, truck. Um, but that's what I think is so interesting about this. So many times in our communities, we, our departments may be um, kind of operating in silos and not so much in Clawson because I think you've got a small enough team um, and I think there is a lot of collaboration um, with your, within your department heads, but it's interesting when we start talking about funding and funding sources and things that departments need. When we go through this process, everybody then has the opportunity to hear what each department needs. So we go through the process, we explain it, um, we get, gather up all of the policies so that, that that may be any of the resources that any of these department heads might need. So whether it's a recreation plan or the master plan or other um, new federal or state laws, anything that the people were, are gonna need to be able to determine what kinds of projects are gonna be included in the capital improvement plan. We gather all those folks together. And this would also include not only the department heads, but it would also include a little subcommittee of, I think it's helpful, a subcommittee of your planning commission. So maybe three to four people from the planning commission are involved in this process as well. The department heads go and they take their application forms and they fill out all the projects that they have in mind. They put down what the project is, um, they talk about why they need it, what year it would be if we're talking about a six year projection, what the estimated costs are going to be and where those funds are gonna come from. Um, sometimes, for example, if a recreation uh, department identifies the need for new playground equipment or a new park facility, they may say in there, well, we want, um, we're going to get a grant for this, but um, so we're going to put that on our list. It's important in this process to include matching funds so that you're not caught three years from now, oh, we were going to get a grant for that. Oh, we have to match it by, by half. Um, to make sure that we get uh, good enough points so that we can get this award. Um, these are things that we wanna think about as we're building the capital improvement plan. So all the projects get submitted and then the team gets back together and they start to review those and score those project applications. We've got, we develop a ranking system as a team where we identify what, what are we gonna award the most points to? Typically anything that's required by federal or state law is gonna get a high score. It's, you have to do it. It's gonna to have to get done. We'll figure that out. Other things, maybe they're um, things that eventually will save costs, save the community costs in the long run. So maybe we're gonna save money on maintenance in the long run. Um, we're gonna save money on operations in the long run. Those might be things that we elevate a little bit higher. Um, we could say things that implement the master plan and the recreation plan. We can give some extra points for those things. Um, that helps us determine um, which items really need to rise to the top, the things that we really need to make sure we identify funding for and include those in the document. Then it goes to the planning commission. 
This is where when new planning commissions, not new planning commissions, planning commissions are starting to review the capital improvement plan for the first time, often the wheels kind of fall apart here because planning commissioners are not used to seeing this information. They are not used to looking at spreadsheets of projects and requests and new police vehicles and um, a new backhoe for the DPW. Um, and there is a measure of allowing the department heads then to explain why these things are needed, talk about funding, why this truck costs this much money and why we need it in year three. Um, and really, you know, there's always, there's always some interesting story about why it's needed then and not needed later. Or sometimes there isn't. And they say, you know what, we probably could push this into year four if we need to move something up further. The advantage of that we're doing when we do all of this together is that we are able to see, we only have, we know we only have a certain amount of resources. And so by doing this together, we see that it's trade-offs. It's looking at, well, where can we get the most bang for our buck, so to speak? Are there projects that can double up? Like, we're, can we do um, a park improvement where we're doing a road improvement and we're doing a sidewalk improvement? Can we do that all together in one part of town so that we can save money and make a more efficient process? That's what this whole process is all about. The other advantage of doing this with the planning commission is that people are used to going to planning commissions for public hearings. Certainly council does public hearings as well, um, but planning commission is, is where we have a lot of public hearings. Um, this process allows, I think, a really nice opportunity for planning commissioners to ask questions of department heads department heads to provide that information and the community to hear it. We usually recommend planning commission have a first review, ask any questions, maybe there's changes, maybe there aren't, and then set the public hearing. And then by the time that this document comes, again, before the planning commission for a public hearing, typically then all the questions are answered. Planning commission takes action and adopts the CIP. And then that goes to city council who will then take that first year and begin to incorporate that into its annual budget. So that's, a, it's a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a good solid long process. Um, it typically would take, um, when we're doing it with our communities, when they start budgeting in February or March, we're typically starting the capital improvement plan, um, maybe back in October or November, ideally. Um, we we do sometimes do them faster because sometimes it's hard to get people thinking about those things in October when they know budget's not until February, March. Um, but it's a really good opportunity. Um, providing this information to the community so that they can understand it really helps people start to understand, um, again, that our resources are limited, um, that we know that we've got things to pay for. We know we've got expenses. Um, and I think it really engages people more in that process of understanding how are we gonna find the resources to tackle these projects? What things can we just simply not do for quite a while? Sometimes things end up getting bumped and bumped and bumped um, because we just don't have the resources to cover it. And at some point you have to say, well, are we gonna keep doing this? Is there another way we can achieve this goal? What are we trying to do here? Um, and going through this process every year, I think is really, really valuable. Um, again, so we talk about ranking, we can talk about some of the things. Um, again, I kind of covered all of those things um, that might be included in ranking. Um, when we talk about funding, we've got some local sources. Certainly we've got general funds, but we also have the ability to have bonds, um, increased millages. Um, we do have TIF available um, and other types of fees. Um, but there's also some state and federal sources that might be available. There are um, MDOT funds, Road Commission funds, uh, DEQ, which we should update to EGLE. Um, but additional facilities improvements like the MNRTF, uh, Natural Resources Trust Fund, um, other enhancement grants, CDBG monies, um, and the like. And so those are important to be thinking about as we are building up um, you know, trying to identify those resources. The capital improvement plan will identify the things that come from general fund, but they'll also say, you know, grant funding, or they'll say uh, whatever those additional funds might be. Maybe it's MDOT. Um, we also provide, there's some other um, resources available for finding money to pay for capital improvements. 
So that's a really short or overview of it. I know that uh, manager Mike wants to. But I still want to ask the question. Yes. Oh, so no, the planning commission did not work on this process this year, but is really excited, I know, about getting into it next year. Well, right. there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, the thing talks about capital. When I look at the one you guys presented, there's a lot of consumables on there. I mean, body armor for police, that's consumable. I hope the guy doesn't have to wear it for four or five years uh, of body armor because it's going to wear out. There's, there's a bunch of that in there. Uh, uh, laptops, uh, they, they come and go. So uh, I really think that this plan, so we don't step on the toes of the planning commission, should be reviewed by the planning commission, selected, ranked. And, uh, you know, there's like nine steps on this on these charts that, she, that uh, I've got done some research on. And uh, <clears throat> when was the kickoff meeting? You know, when did these guys get to look at, start uh, listing their projects? When did they start ranking them? We have a planning commission for a reason and, and they do a great job. And I think really they need to look at this. The, the other thing I looked at the thing and this shows the uh, city manager as a project manager, that should really be uh, the commission to select the person that's the project manager, not uh, our city manager is an asset to the to commission where the, he, they can get information, scheduled meetings and all that and, and help working their way through the staff to find out what kind of projects. We've circumvented all that this year. This was just. Well, yeah, and, and I think those are really, really good questions. This community has not done a capital improvement plan yeah. In this format, yeah, I don't what, think ever. Do you do you remember what meeting? Because uh, I've only been at council eighteen months. What meeting they uh, said that they were going to use a, a pro, uh, the city manager as a project manager for this kind of work instead of using the planning commission? As I said, I don't believe this community has ever endeavored on a capital improvement plan with the planning commission. Um, Glenn, is is that your? So I would, yeah. As far as I dug in the archives, I, I try to track uh, planning commission topics back to 1999 um and i there's not one instance that i could come across where where this was part of our uh our agenda item and if we, it would it would be one of those things that would take multiple uh sessions so it never came up it's okay. honestly it's something that we've um you know when we were um starting to work with the city back in joe is it 2017 Yeah, I, um, I mean, mid-2018, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. February 2018. We've, right? we've, I mean, this is one of the things that we've, a need that we spotted early on, um, and we're excited that you're going to be working on this next, probably September or October. This is a start that you have, um, but yeah, we, then we'll we don't be refined. Have, and, it, yeah. and again, I think another thing to keep in mind, too, that it, a capital improvement plan is not the same as your budget. Your budget is your budget and it is it is fairly set in stone. You're able to amend it, but it's, it takes requires official motions and things. The capital improvement plan, if you have one today, um, when we start working on it in September, it's that's okay. Like there are probably gonna be things that get moved around at that point because you're gonna have different folks working on it. Um, the department heads are still going to have the same input. It's not like it's going to change every year, depending on who's on the planning commission. Um, but it, it will be based on, and in a lot of cases, planning commission really heavily relies on the department heads who really know what they need. I'd um, still and think, I'm, pre I'm sure that's the case here as well. I'd, this I'd, first effort. I'd, I'd still like to see us send whatever this is, if this is a capital improvement program to the planning commission and say, rank these, figure out what you want this turns out to be only a few people's ideas for the entire town and the planning commission are really the eyes and ears of the people to say, this is what we want. These are, you know, we need roads. They need to help us. We, we just can't do this in, in the dark and uh, have one person pick all the projects and, and then put a bunch of stuff that's just consumables on it. This is more like a budget for next year instead of a plan for the future. You're saying you you from what you saw you think this is more of a budget item rather than a capital improvement plan is that what you're saying yeah i i, I don't see you know not, nothing's named like you, you can't tell uh, the citizens hey 
the, the planning commission, they want to do these roads because they get the best bang for the dollar. They want to do this park. They want to do this. It's it's really like uh, we got 20 bucks in for the parking. We're going to do some roads. Which ones? Uh, we'll tell you when we get there. You guys would do a much better job at this by saying these are we we ran on these roads. You guys need to fix these roads and these roads. We've talked to the people. They've come to the public hearing. That would be the best way. Uh, if we follow these nine steps, we could we for this year we could rush the nine steps. I think, but give it to you guys and you go through this. Uh, this uh, CIP plan that we got now and tell us what to do, what the best bang, what the people want. I think that would be a better thing for us to do. I, and, I, I would I would agree with you. Um, we've got a full plate, not this, not to be afraid of a full plate. Yeah. Um, you know, and as far as I want to do this, you know, personally, I want to do this the right way. Um, make sure that we're, we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's. So at this point, the fact that we've not you know, and again, it just, I went back, like I said, it probably goes even farther than 1999 as far as a, a capital improvement plan, plan not, not coming in front of planning commission, right? So, I, 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 you know, it's not time to, to take baby steps with this. We've got to make sure that we do it properly. Um, I don't know if this is the, the proper way of doing it. Um, it is a way of doing it. Um, but I would have rather have it come in front of us so that we know that we have the option of taking a look at it and decide what direction uh, we go with that. Um, I, I, I would agree that if you, if you guys take it over that uh, we do a plan for next year and start early right now and start putting some of these things that are on this list. Well, you we guys... also have yeah, and, and, uh, pardon uh, eruption, but we also have a master plan that's coming up too. Yeah. So is there a way that we can dovetail all of this together and to make sure that we're doing the master plan in consideration with the capital improvement plan so that it goes one after the other? Yes. Or well, I think that's kind of what we thought. And we were hoping, I mean, that's why we were really happy to have the opportunity to give you the tr little overview training of what capital improvement planning is mm -hmm. for all of you so that you would all have an understanding about, you know, what it is, why we do it, of a general basic idea of how we're going to do it mm -hmm. and then be thinking about that for probably September, October, um, which I think follows up with our, our master plan. Um, and then we get into that. It's a nice time because then it really does lead into the budget for planning for 2022. So that was uh, our recommendation, but certainly, you know, we'll defer to your direction. Yeah. Hey, Glenn, I agree with you that we need to do a master plan. Then you take a, capital improvement plan to make sure it matches the master plan then, then we can do a budget we can do goals for the city then, mm -hmm. then mike can do his goals to match our goals and then when we all get done all the goals line up all the way across all four programs absolutely so we're all, so we're all working to, right now we're just shoot, we're just shooting in the dark right now look you know i've always said as far as when i walk in the room i know i'm not the smartest person there so i'll rely on somebody else Right. And so uh -huh. that's basically where, you know, but at the same time, you know, it, to have that opportunity to, to go through the process first, I really appreciate, uh, Jill, that, that you're doing this and giving us some information. It's, it's vital. Um, when this first came up, uh, brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago, I just did a, a, you know, a couple of things uh, to look this up as far as where we were as a community and what's happened. And what's interesting is I came across the Michigan State University Extension for planning, and it, it, the, the article is titled The Forgotten Law, Planning Commission Review of Capital Expenditures. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> it, it sailed right by us. Yeah. Um, and again, I, you know, I, I would defer to expertise, but at the same time, given an opportunity to review it before we necessarily just, you know, hand, hand it over. Have, um, you, have, have you got a chance to read the Enabling Act? Uh, just briefly. I mean, it's it's long and, and just yeah. making sure as far as where we are as a planning commission and what our responsibilities are. Because it's, at the yeah. same time, I don't want to necessarily, I don't know what the word is, abrogate our responsibility, you know, but I'd still defer yeah. to, you know, have somebody come in with, as experts as, as as Jill and Joe and, 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 and Mike are as far as providing that information. Yeah. So I think it, it's still it, doing it the right way is what I'd like to try and see. Uh, since, since you guys are in it, uh exempt from this i mean it, it, it's really your show i know it, it, I just... you, you have all the power <laughs> and, and i think mike needs your help yeah so 
and I, you know, as far as making sure that we have input so that he, had, you know, Mike, you've got direction from us and certainly input from you that we have the conversation so that we can make sure that all our bases are covered. So, but I think it should come in, in, to us. Hey, Joe, can I ask a random question? I guess not too random, but hey, is that flow chart that you had on here anywhere? Mm -hmm. I feel like I want to reference that. Is it in our packet that I just glanced over and didn't see? No, like, I didn't. Uh, you... No, that this part was just our overview training to like this introducing the topic to you. I know we haven't discussed this as a planning commission or as a city council together. Um, and that's why we wanted to do it with you tonight so that when it does come to the planning commission and I said earlier that you were excited uh -huh. about it, I, meant more like I'm sure you will be excited about it. Um, just like you are with everything, the Planning Commission um, really does kind of jump into everything uh, with all you've got and I appreciate that. Um, and so I know you'll take the same amount of uh, serious work on this as you do with other things. Um, but we will definitely, I mean, I can send the whole um, power, the PDF of everything we talked about tonight. Um, we'll also send that to um, Nick and we can get that shared or posted however yeah. we are now. I, 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 got a re I, got, I got a really good capital improvement planning guide that I that I got and uh, I'll send resources that we'll share with the yeah. planning commission. I'll, I'm going to send it to Nick and he can send it to everybody on this okay. call and you can all read it is it really helps out it's got nice steps and, and it fits in with what Jill's talking about they both blend in together it's just that we're talking a lot about how great this plan is but we haven't did this plan yet. Well, no, we haven't done it yet. That's why we we're giving you the overview. So that yeah, you but, know but, 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 but somebody, but somebody, you got, you just sent a thing saying this is your capital improvement plan for 2021, 22. Well, no, that, and, and it's not a plan. It's just right, no, a budget. Manager, and I know that um, city manager wanted to talk about that. So I probably will let him talk about it because my role was just to tell you the training and, uh, and what's coming up. And then I'll let the manager discuss uh, the rest of that include that thing that was included, the document that was included. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send this to everybody. Thank you, Jill. Um, yes, this is our start. Jill and I have spoken, and Joe as well, at the development team meetings uh, numerous times about how we know uh, since 2008, uh, so 13 years, uh, we've never truly had this connection between planning commission and council. And that is our plan. Uh, the, the, the document that was provided is actually a template that I use from Giffels and Webster. Uh, as the general document, I appreciate the information she shared tonight. We do know that we are behind this, and Kelly and I have uh, presented some of these, these topics. We do know moving forward, uh, we do know the Planning Enabling Act, and of course, uh, we will work together with um, Planning Commission to follow the process uh, accordingly uh, this fall and moving through that. Now that we have Kelly in place as our new finance director, uh, we know all these things. I just wanted to pro provide a brief update. Uh, we will fix any of the issues that we talked about with consumables, as, as mentioned, uh, Councilmember Sampson and uh, Glenn uh, is tied to all these things. Uh, we do know, I just wanted to reiterate that there are many funds, as, as Jill mentioned, and of course, approval of the SIP, the Capital Improvement Plan, does not signify final approval or funding of any project contained within that plan, as things can change. As we know, uh, it is kind of a template. It is a, a, it is a roadmap, uh, I believe, to, to looking forward as we work through some of these things. I just wanted to highlight the fact that we do know that we are receiving, um, we're still waiting to see when we get the first 50%, but with the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 that was uh, detailed, I just received word from our uh, congressional office that, that we should be getting it uh, at some point, at least our first uh, payment of our 1.1 million uh, that we have, and it's gonna be very dedicated to what we can utilize it for. Um, many of those things are for um, addressing economic impacts that we have, uh, lost public sector revenue, of course, and primarily dealing with investing in water and sewer and broadband infrastructure, uh, making the necessary investments in those. So we do know that that money is there, uh, that will be coming, uh, that we will have to work in concert with uh, Planning Commission and Council uh, moving forward with this fall. Uh, we do, with those funds, they must be obligated by December 31st of 2024 and spent by December 31st, 2026. So again, uh, it's these first steps that we know we need to do that we've been not doing. Uh, and this is kind of the, the guide was this overview just to state that we've seen that we need to do this and uh, we're gonna work together uh, this fall and get the, the names in place, get the, the team in place, the committee appropriately, uh, remove myself, of course, be just a part of it as an advisory position, but I know planning commission uh, per the enabling act 
uh, kind of assigns a, a leader, if you will, chairperson, and we will move forward with that moving forward. So okay, I will review um, the capital uh, budgeting items uh, to see what is actually necessary and then resubmit uh, that for this year. And then following this fall, as you stated, uh, we'll get a jump on that in October and we'll be following that process you, you so eloquently outlined with the with the steps. So that's all I want. Yeah. So, so Mike, you, hello, you, hello, you, hello, Mike. Hello, can you hear me? I'll let him, George, go. Can George go? Yeah. Hey, George. Very quickly, can you tell me how long it took to prepare this uh, capital improvement budget that you have here? How long? Um, um, I mean, thing? the actual, the document, the Word document. From, I, no, from beginning to end, what did it take? Beginning to end? Yeah, you had source documents that you got from your department heads. Yes. Okay. Is that correct? Yes. To the presentation that we see right now. Uh, I think once we got all that, and then we started going back and forth with the workshops. Uh, I think Kelly and I got all that placed probably two months. Okay. Mike, you, you said you did some of this uh, So you guys put projects down. Did you rank them and all that? And do you go through some of them steps? We, we listened to our department heads and what the needs of that, what they stated were the, um, the necessary projects this upcoming year. That's what we put in this first year. You, you get any, any uh, minutes from the meetings where you could share with us of what the, what their projects were and how you guys ranked them and stuff like that. that and you made a statement that you didn't think that that, well, CIP that you send is the final one. Are you going to send a new one? Are you, uh, yeah. Once now that we've heard what yeah. some of your statements this evening, Kelly and yeah. I can yeah. work on that. Wait, well, why did why did you send that to us? It looks like council knew all about it. It looks like council uh, like like we approved it, and, and most of us, I, I, myself, it's like, geez, I didn't. I must have missed that meeting, and I haven't missed a meeting yet. So that uh, though, that uh, document was provided at one of the workshops at the last meeting. Mike, quick question. Okay. Yes. Can can we actually sit down and see the work paper and the source documents? Physically look at them. Uh, I mean, I just, there's. Pardon? I was just going to chime in for a second. I think if I'm, and maybe I'm out of line with, yeah. with this comment, but seemed to me that we weren't, the planning commission wasn't going to be asked to review this document. The planning commission was going to maybe take this as a background document for what our work in September, October. Right. That was the intent. Yes. But you also want to see your background source documents that create these numbers. Okay. How do they determine they want uh, $200,000 for a uh, concrete pavement repair pad? Does that make sense? Yeah, I can provide that to you. That was based on the asset management plan that our, the engineering firm reported to council back in March of 2020. We so, those numbers exactly from that. that so uh, it sounds like, Mike, not to cut you off, but that, that you can provide that level of information for planning at the, at the appropriate time. Yes, yes. Right. All this okay. was serving tonight, uh, again, intent, you know, Zoom, uh, those issues like that. Yeah. This, that we're, it's on our radar. We're going to follow the proper process this fall. And that is where Jill and I were. We wanted to kind of disseminate that this evening. So, so you're saying this is not, we don't have a CIP for this year then? Really? We have necessary needs that we have for capital improvements uh, per what the department has stated. Okay. We, Kelly and I will go back and we'll yeah. reiterate that. But as but, far as this long <laughs> longitudinal document that you're asking, with yeah. you no, know, that's not occurred this year. Yeah, we, haven't, we don't have any future plans just this year. So as far as the information that you presented, that one can that be in front of us on a, uh, as an agenda item? It can go, we can talk about it at the meeting tomorrow and I can provide it to you where I got the numbers from at the next meeting, which is uh, June 8th. Is that the next planning meeting, Jill? Yes. Okay. I, I mean, as far as I, I keep hearing, and I, I want to stress, we, we want to do this the right way. Right. And, uh, you know, let's let's get it in front of us and then, you know, let's let's discuss it as we should. Um, and, you know, and the information that you've got, provide that in a, in the document, you know, have those as as George is pointing out, you know, what the references are as far as that, that basis for those needs. And let's discuss it. 
and, and you'll send recommendations to the council or your opinion. Follow the, the process. Right? All right, sounds great. If, and if I can, if we're gonna follow the process, um, one of the things that we do with our communities that are embarking on this is those forms are filled out. And so I don't know that we're gonna be ready for this on June 8th because I don't know that you've, if you did the forms, like if they're compiled in a way yeah. that can be transmitted because that's typically how we do it. And, okay. and what it might suggest is that rather than start it with the full planning commission, that maybe the planning commission at their next meeting wants to create a, the subcommittee. Um, because then you're able to get into some of this a little bit more um, thoroughly. You can ask some of the deeper questions that really may be kind of unwieldy with nine of you uh, at a, the, uh, a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, certainly all the meetings are, you can keep minutes and, and keep track of what's being discussed. Um, it'll come back to the full planning commission eventually. Um, I just offer that as something that has worked in our other communities that we work with. Um, yeah. One of the things that I think is really important about it's transparent. Sorry, because I, I think the transparency is one of the big benefits of doing this process this way. I, I feel almost right now, like we're rushing it a little bit to try to satisfy this, um, but we can, we can certainly do that with the planning commission, but I don't know if June 8th is gonna give us the time to collect all that background that makes for a meaningful conversation with the planning commission on the 8th. We, yep. we, ju we just aren't trying to satisfy yep. a, just a, a, a document. We're trying to satisfy that we're using our money right this year and we're going to use our money right next year and the year after. So whatever we can do to get Glenn whatever he needs, it be, would be... Set aside the politicking. Okay, the question I have is... When we do this, when we do this document, when does it have to present, be presented to the in-person, which is city council? Most communities will have it be done. If so, for example, if your budgeting starts in March, February, March, typically the CIP would need to be done in January or February of okay. that year leading right, because it leads right into it. So um, okay. that's why we were saying, if you were doing it in September, October, that would give you plenty of time to put this all together. I, I, I kind of I kind of missed the point. If we start in March, okay, and it's due January, you're no. talking next year. Well, yeah. If you yeah, you planning commission would probably start it in really in October, November. And then it would be due January. Yeah, January, February. Okay, it's probably the first year, probably the first two years. It might take a little bit longer until everybody's got a good grasp on the process and that's okay. We could start it in September. It doesn't well, have to be, there's no deadline for it. It's well, just Mike helpful said, when it comes along with budgeting, planning for the budget. What Mike said is that it took him two months to put it together. So if we do it in October, okay, and we have some guidance, okay, we should be able to hit the two month. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the question is how much time was spent on creating the document, okay? You know, it took them two months, but how much of those two months, how much time? Is it three weeks, four weeks to do it? Do you understand the, the, the question that I'm really asking? Is how much, uh, how much, uh, how much human uh, time do we need to make this document? The planning commission or? No, the planning commission, because we're the one that's going to have to make it. Okay, so that's a good question. And the planning commission is not going to be expected to put out the spreadsheet that will be done administratively. Um, the role of the planning commission is really to, to re you've got a couple of planning commissioners who are gonna be involved in that team process where we talk about the rankings, we talk about the projects, um, they will con be contributing members of that team um, and all of the department heads will be advocating for their own projects and listening for, again, opportunities to collaborate or, or come together on certain things. When it comes to the full planning commission, you were looking at the big picture. You are looking at, um, you're listening to the different uh, department heads talk about their projects. You're listening to how that process evaluated projects. You're looking for things that, that connect the dots. You're not gonna be saying, I mean, you can ask, well, are you sure that truck costs $250,000? Have you looked on, any place else to find it? Is there another community? Like at the at that big picture level, you are going to 
um, hopefully be comfortable that the team that prepared the document itself did all of that work and that the team asked all of those questions. And because you're gonna have a couple of planning commissioners on there, when they come to you as the full complement of the planning commission, they'll say, yes, we did, we talked about that. And you know, we looked at another community and they can't get that. So we, we're pretty comfortable that the numbers are, are right. So we've got the working group who will put in a lot more time. Planning commission itself, the full complement, it's probably, probably your first year, maybe two meetings and then a third as your public hearing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's what you were asking, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, Jill, can I ask now? <laughs> um, so when, you know, just things that I was thinking about in my own head when I'm looking at this, um, like, is there a way that even if we do form a subcommittee that we have some type of document that shows us um, you know, that might have a certain criteria that they go through, like that say technology has changed in the police department and they've, they've suddenly needed to upgrade these items that mm -hmm. might take precedence over certain other things, just a, a, uh, a resource that might be able to, we could read over without mm -hmm. having, I know that we could go into very lengthy discussions in commission, right? Um, but just, where it kind of breaks down the thought process of the ranking criteria. Is that Absolutely. something that the that goes with the document would... itself? I... Okay. That goes with the document itself. And like I said, you know, it, as far as what Joe and I bring to this process is that it, it's our interest in seeing this be as, as I said before, transparent, but really accessible to the public, accessible to the community. We want the community to be able to understand why the police department needs new um, body armor. We want them to understand why um, a certain street is going to be repaired. We want them to understand why other things aren't happening because we don't have the resources to do all of it and we had to prioritize and here's how we did it. And so when we break it down by each of the departments and what they need, there's usually the way we like to do it as a little bit of a text that describes that, what those things are. In, in 2020, a new law was passed that said um, that police departments had to provide blah, blah, blah. We're gonna put that in there. That's why this project is here. Um, it's, you know, there's there's gonna be a point where we, you know, we don't include all of it because people won't read it, but at least if we put stuff in the appendix and we have it available and then try to have like hit the highlights in the document itself, we really want people to be able to understand all this. That's the important part of this is seeing the all the needs of the community and how they're trying to be met. So do you have a certain criteria for that appendix? Like, uh, let's say from just this one pulling, and I don't mean to pick on the police. I'm not, I don't, <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on their funding. They, you know, they deserve funding. Um, so like the, the vest, do you kind of break it down in terms of like how many they have the life longevity of a vest and like, do you break it down in those terms or is that too detailed in terms of like how you rank them? I think it's a good question and it'll depend probably on the item and it'll probably depend on the, the committee that's that's building that CIP. If okay. it seems pretty clear, like, well, you know, we've got 20 officers that need them because they're beyond the five-year life expectancy, that may be all we need to know. Um, it may be to the point where we have all that information, it comes to the planning commission, the planning commission says, you know, I don't really understand why you need these. Um, if there's not that documentation in there, that that can be something that's brought back um, and provided additionally. Um, but that process by which the rankings are made, that's going to be documented in the in the CIP itself as well. Oh, okay. And that may be something that, you know, it's not something that's like a stock, there's guidelines for it, but that committee, that'll be really the first thing they do is we're going to say, I mean, it will, it, they, they tend to look very similar. Um, but that will be fit to the community. And that's based on that, that group that gets together initially. I think. Jill? Mm -hmm. um, Greg and Mike and I just took the training, the CIP training with uh, Michigan Association of Planning. Mm -hmm. So I asked them for slides, but I haven't got those, but I, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I've got his, yeah. So um, I did, I did copy the booklet 
Mm -hmm. And what was really good in that was the, I think the end of the sessions where we did role playing yeah, and everybody had to be either a department head or a mm -hmm. citizen and right. all the projects for that community were in there and they, you had to rank them based on how much money you had or, or if there was like you mentioned before grant funding for something and that was going to expire so that got a you know a higher priority and they looked at what was in their master plans and what what things their master plan had called for so those mm -hmm. it, it pulled every everything and it was a really good session and and um i do have the um the worksheets from that it just might help somebody to even look at that to see what a worksheet could look like it was really yes. helpful it is helpful. I've actually facilitated that training at the Michigan Association of Planning, and I've also done it with the Michigan Municipal Executives, um, and I've done it for our different communities as well. So we have um, a lot of background in it, and we oh, have a lot of the sure. forms, and um, we've got some other, I think, kind of um, good tools that we can use to share information um, with the community as well, including online platforms. So we can talk about that too. What about MSU's uh, capital uh, uh, improvement program or class? It, it's probably fairly similar. Um, I was I meant to follow up when Joan talked about the the exercises. That is probably one of the more interesting things. Um, and I had thought about doing it, um, but I didn't think that this format would work as well for that. I know probably in the map training, you got to break out into the breakout rooms and I did, wasn't sure we'd be able to do that. Um, but that is certainly something that we could do if we wanted to um, later in the summer or at our next joint meeting. Can we, Mike, can you put on the agenda for us to talk about scheduling a training for all of us on this call at one time? And then, then we'll all hear the same information. We'll all know where, which way we're marching. That this pretty much is the training. I mean, this is the training that I did at MAP. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Can we bring it to do, to, to do it for all of us, the council, for the planning board? For that the, would be, planning. maybe that could be the second meeting, Jill, that you said that we have to, that we're required to have the two joint workshops later in the fall. Mm -hmm. Later in the fall. And we can do the, that would be great because then hopefully we'll, well be together. Yeah. And we can how, do the, um, the how training. Late the how, late in the how late in the fall? Because these guys got to get started in what you said, September, October? Yeah. So September, August, September, August, September would be better. We have four months. Yeah. Yeah. We could, like, we, we've talked about it. How? Oh, yeah. September, October. There. We, we'll make sure that it'll be on the, uh, to have the, at the next joint workshop to have that as a training. Anything else? I'm good. Thank you, Joe. All right. Um, oh, the next item, I'm not gonna share my screen necessarily, um, was to talk again. Um, it was council member Sampson's request uh, when we presented the information on the B1 zoning amendment. Um, Following the public hearing and recommendation by Planning Commission, we went to council with this last week on Tuesday, and it was adopted at the first reading. But I know that Commissioner or Council Member Sampson, excuse me, had some comments and he asked if we would put this on the agenda. Um, and so I maybe will defer to him if he's got specific questions that he wanted asked or answered this time. Well, the question, same question is uh, you didn't explain it enough to understand it what what good it is and what what are the good points and what are the bad points you know what why do we want to do this so the proposal if you will recall um for amending the b1 district to allow and i can i can share my screen because i did put it together here and i'm going to kind of wing through it so I'll remind you that this was something that was raised by a property owner at 288 West 14 Mile. Um, that was a uh, residential structure in the B1 district um, where single family dwellings are not currently permitted. 
Um, it was an existing non-conforming use at the time and it did receive site plan approval uh, to be used and it was used briefly as a retail and a gallery space. Um, but then their plans changed and given its form as a single family home, the property owners were finding it difficult to, um, to sell that property. And so they came and asked the planning commission um, for consideration of allowing residential uses again in this district. And so we talked a little bit about what the intent of that B1 district is, is really providing for um, retail businesses and service uses for the nearby areas. Um, and then talking about the potential impacts of allowing the residential uses in the B1 district. So on some of the, the flip sides is we talked about maybe losing spaces to convenience uh, for convenience retailers if we allowed those structures to be to be um, used or to be have new buildings built as single family structures because that was originally where the discussion started was just to allow single family residential in the B1 district. Um, but we know based on this, this property owner's experience that they shared with us that existing residential structures, once they change to business uses, um, that it, it's difficult to turn it back. So the planning commission did discuss this and felt that in the very specific cases where there were single family residential structures in the B1 district, um, that they could be used as residential structures. They were still allowed to do that as being non-conforming uses anyway, but that they could be improved or expanded um, with the standards of the R2 district. And that if they had been converted to commercial uses, they could be converted back to a single family residential use. And then to allow for some additional flexibility to allow the additional use of a live work unit. This has the added bonus of allowing, um, again, allowing some flexibility, um, recognizing that um, adding more residential um, dwellings in and near businesses promotes walkability. Um, it's good for businesses to have residents um, accessible and close by. It's also good for business owners to be able to live on site if they should so choose. Um, Planning Commission, and I can let the Planning Commission talk about this if, if they have anything that they wanna add in. Um, we added, we did talk about the live work and we added parking for that. And again, this impacts really um, the B1 district, which are outlined in the bright red areas here. Yeah. So Jill, if, you, if I could give additional background. Um, so what happened was that, so uh, I can't remember, the Tribal Fair was the business um, and you know, we had actually worked with them and putting together a plan so that they could be successful in a phase, phased operation. Um, and as it turned out, their phase two uh, was set to occur uh, during COVID. And as that happened, that they lost their business. Um, but one of the things that they were trying to do in order to sell their property was to uh, come in front of us and present a new ordinance that they asked us to adopt. And the way that that new proposed ordinance uh, was presented was that that could potentially have a, a, a unforeseen impact on some of the other businesses in, the, in, in, that, in that zone. Um, so that you could potentially, you know, as crazy as it may sound, have a residence at the backside of Pet Boys and they don't necessarily have to change anything. Now, I mean, that's, I, I'm exaggerating. But essentially, that's where that was going. And so rather than necessarily, you know, uh, uh, um, just reject it out of hand, it raised a good question. What happens to those properties that are homes that are then switched over to, to businesses? And the way it was written, they couldn't go back. So we thought, well, let's take a look at that. And I thought that it was probably a fair thing to just make sure as far as, OK, who, where is this impacted? What does this mean? And, you know, will that, you know, there are other uh, folks and property owners that would, uh, that would this way positively benefit rather than adversely benefit as far as once they decided to change their property. And, and that's, that was the, the, the uh, gist of it. Hey, Glenn, I got a, the question that threw me off was the uh, antique shop on Rochester, which is an old gas station. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. 
So you're saying that person could put a house attached to that? They could build a house attached to that? No, the way that, if I recall correctly, the way that they had proposed their ordinance was that they could just set up a bedroom in the front shop because the way that they wanted to be able to resell their home as a residence so that there was no other further consideration as far as, okay, well, what was it before? What can we do in order to try and, and, and that seemed a little on the ridiculous side and, and Jill, maybe I'm over-exaggerating, but that's kind of where we were leading that, okay, let's fine tune this mm -hmm. so that it makes sense, All right? So, so what could that antique shop do? Oh, you could, I mean, you could basically have been, you know, instead of a garage doors open, you know, you could put a little kitchenette in there in a the bedroom, right? Not change it. You mean, <laughs> so. I mean now though, Glenn, you mean now. <laughs> oh, now? No. Oh, now? Oh, now? Yes. Well, yeah. uh, that's it, what confused me. No, because the way it was, <laughs> and Jill, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, because it wasn't a residence before, they can't necessarily go back as far as right. It was right. addressing those homes that are homes that exactly. went to business and then back. So, and again, not not to you know add any more confusion to it, but the way that they had proposed originally in order to sell their house as a residence, any structure that was in the B1 could potentially be sold as a residence. Okay, that's... That would have helped, Jill, because when I asked you about building a home, I you said well, you're, they could, and oh, that's no, what that's what confused me is like. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's what confused me is we don't want somebody building a home behind a gas station. Oh, no, to, we didn't want that. Yeah, and make it a right. two story a two story house with a gas station underneath oh. it. So, and it, that's why it didn't make any sense to me when you were talking. Well, it makes now I understand, and now I, it makes sense. I confused you. That was, I yeah. did not understand that. And hopefully I, I explained that portion of it correctly, but. Uh, this is Jim McHale. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just uh, maybe help things out on that. Uh, with that particular residence on 14 Mile, they bought it as the trade, yes. And you, we did that change due to the flexibility of being able to sell that house as a business again or a residence. Now, you've got neighbors on each side, so you've got residents right there at that particular section of 14 as it is. But this gave the owner a little more flexibility to be able to sell the house as a residency or as both a residency, which we clarified as if he had quarters upstairs and his, we'll say, display area downstairs. But it was for clarity to be able to, and flexibility to be able to market that particular house. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's, let's broaden that, right? It wasn't specifically for that. They raised the point that made us reevaluate what we had as far as any other property owners that may be in a similar situation. Yeah. No, it, it, Understood. The, thanks for your time, guys, because it, it cleared it up. You know, the one on 14 mile looks like a house. Smells like a house. The one on Rochester Road looks like a gas station. I'm thinking, oh, you're going to build a house on top of that? Yeah, well, you, you yeah, could. That, that totally confused me. Yeah. It's like, a, I don't want a bunch of them houses on, on, in a business district. You know, everybody start building on yeah. top of a... Uh, Key Bank could have turned yeah. over into a house and they could set a bedroom in the, in yeah. the, uh, in the vault, right? Yeah. I mean, that was essentially where they were headed with that. Yeah, Dick uh, Julian lives at the, yeah. at, the, at the restaurant or at his bakery. He, he might want to just live upstairs. <laughs> I don't think he has an upstairs, right? He doesn't. Yeah, separate it. issue, Lou. Yeah. Separate issue. <laughs> so yeah. hopefully we answered your question. Thanks, yeah, Joe. That, that, that helped. It. Appreciate it. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, did we have anything else? Oh, yeah, we did. We had the... I'll go back and share my screen again. The last very short thing that I wanted to share with you, um, as you know, we were working on a master plan amendment. Um, this is just a small update just to give you an idea of where we are in the process. Um, as you know, um, we, with the planning commission, began this process of looking at the master plan in response to um, the conversations that the schools were having about co consolidation, potential consolidation, um, and what that was gonna look like, um, just to try to get ahead of things. Um, we know that um, in the past there have been, 
you know, large pieces of property that have become available. Um, and when development comes in there that people aren't expecting and it doesn't look the way they want it to look, um, it can be dis disturbing and it can cause a lot of controversy and chaos. Um, so the planning commission has been down that road and, and thought this was a good opportunity to be able to think ahead um, and to plan a little bit um, and to really kind of think out of the box in terms of, you know, what do we want for, when we're really talking about residential development here. Um, and so exploring that. So through the last couple of months, we've looked at some of the existing conditions, primarily demographics, just to update those from the 2017 plan, um, which didn't really address these um, properties at all, other than just to acknowledge that they were public or quasi-public properties, the school properties. Um, we've talked about the goals and objectives of the master plan, and we've uh, facilitated two focus groups discussions with our local real estate professionals um, to get some really insider um, conversations about local housing and the communities and the surrounding communities. Um, we've talked about different housing types and what those might look like um, and what we think about those and if those are something that are needed. And so that's really what we're gonna be doing um, with the community at a public input open house on Wednesday, June 9th from four to six. And we're having it at City Hall and we're so excited. I don't wanna say it, we're so excited. I'm excited that we get to do this in public. Um, open houses are probably one of the more, um, they're, I don't know, they're more fun. They, they give us a chance to have casual conversations, um, talk to people, get their ideas, their input, their comments, um, and then bring that back to the planning commission. And we'll, we'll work on wrapping up the final draft of that over the summer. And then um, there is a review period for that um, with the Michigan Planning Enabling Act. And then we will have a public hearing and action on that plan amendment and that will then come to council. But we just wanted you to be updated and we wanted you to know about the open house and um, we'll be putting that information up on the website so that people are aware of it and we hope everybody comes to participate. Are you, are you gonna send invitations out on our email chain? Yes, that's a good idea. And we'll get information um, to the city to put out in that format. Hey, Joe, could you speak a little bit to, um, it, like, ultimately the school, we're still working with the school board, right, then? Is that what you're saying? Because I, I would think that the school board has more way on this. So I'm still a little bit confused about the planning commission is going to be doing what, determining what in this process? Because isn't it the school's choice? It's the school's choice to sell the property, but once it's sold, it becomes private property, and then that private property owner has to follow all of the rules and conditions that the city has for properties. Um, so they could, in theory, um, somebody, if they wanted to um, split property or do um, a new development project, their residential development project, they have to go through the city's process. And having the goal of this is having a vision uh, of what would the city would like to see there and then potentially having zoning standards even in place or be being able to develop some zoning standards over the following months um, so that the community is really ready when these properties become available. We know that um, Clawson is a very um, desirable location and we know that that once property like that becomes available it won't take long before somebody's knocking at the door of City Hall saying we want to develop on this property. And we incur, or have been encouraging the community to be prepared for that and to express that what they'd like to see on those areas. Knowing that once it is proper, private property, we do have to allow some redevelopment there, but can we shape it um, so that it serves the needs of the community and it it's, fits in with the nearby neighborhoods? So, so when, when they do sell it, does that, um, because right now it's zoned as its own special use, right? Like public use um would it fall into automatically into like a residential zoning though yes, or does. just that is that yeah no it does fall into residential zoning i think it's our i think r2 is what it is you had the plots r2. from 19 whatever it was right mm -hmm. 20 something that you had shown right and at the end of the day that might be what the community is okay is like that's what we're that's what we have we're expecting it we know what to expect we like it um maybe there's some additional form conditions that we want to put on that. Like we want to make sure that 
they have detached garages in this area, you know, what, whatever it might be, um, that we make it easy for people to develop the kind of homes that people in the community want to see. So should we be looking yes. at other locations besides the school properties that, that we want to have that happen? Because quite honestly, this all is dependent upon the school uh, passing the bond. Right, absolutely. It, and, and that may, it may come to pass that the, city, that the schools do not sell property right now. But at least the city will have an idea of what housing needs there are Mm -hmm. and what housing types might be desired by the community. And when other property comes available to your point, mm -hmm. um, which could include a church or it could include some other type of institutional or, or um, property that's used in, that's non-residential use in a residential area, mm -hmm. then we have this, this information to, to have handy for us. And the reason why I bring that up is that there was a proposal that was brought in front of us uh, a couple of years ago uh, over by, uh, it was on Grove or Park mm -hmm. or over on the east side. Uh, that was the uh, uh, church's property. And that there was, you know, somebody had said, well, this is how we, we need to, to subdivide the property in order for us to be profitable. Uh, I don't think we've seen it since then. Um, and, and that's why I was asking as far as do we need to look at other places along with the, the uh, proposed school properties. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. So would this be an amendment type ordinance that would say that any once public then sold would have to conform to these type of things essentially? Is that is that no, right now we're just talking about the long term vision. So the master plan okay. is just going to say if we're presented with a land use decision, like a rezoning or um, maybe a plan unit development again, we will have updated language in our master plan that will support uh, what the community's vision is and then help the planning commission and city council make those land use decisions. Like if there was a rezoning, something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim McHale property. again, Colton, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just, I just wanted to follow up. Is this specifically for like one's own public property or this this would be like one's own, like churches and things still, like that? I think that's still up for the planning commission's discussion. But yes, I, I okay. mean, I think that's a very um, logical next step to be thinking about. Like if so, if we do this here, we know that there's other properties that might be available and maybe we should think about it in these locations as well. Um, you might even say as the, as the plan is, is you know, we've identified it for these areas, but we also recognize that there are these other areas. I mean, you may not even need to be specific, but you could describe the conditions by which other properties might fit the same vision, if that makes sense. And then any yeah. ordinance language that, that does impact the legal ability for people to redevelop their property, any of those ordinance changes would come after the plan. And so we'll talk about okay. that later, what those look like. So it would also have to dovetail into and fit with our uh, large lot ordinance that we that absolutely. We yep. Yep. Uh, Jim McHale. Um, yeah. In answering question number one, uh, that was the Parkland area, Glenn. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, in reference to selling and buying the school property, uh, I raised it up before that uh, the possibility, like you mentioned, a church, Jill, but it could be another school like a Montessori or something like that, that ends up with the high amount of bid. Mm -hmm. That's true. So that's another item to consider on that too. Mm -hmm. for talking purposes. Yes. <clears throat> Something else to consider, uh, this might be really off base, but if the school sells their property, would that affect the map that we have made out where the marijuana places could go or not? Would that, would that open up more room for them this just because those not that are in question right now, I don't believe so, but I'd have to yeah, look to make sure I, I can look. Change down, down the line, change. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Okay. I would say good yeah. if we don't uh, have setback for residential for sure. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, the, that's one of the reasons why I think there there needs to be a residential setback, <laughs> not to go back to where we were, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think it would change it. Thank you. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions on that, um, the next thing that we were gonna ask was for other items to, of interest to Planning Commission, DDA and Council for future meetings. Just to see Who do I send my phone bill to? <clears throat> I, I think we need to get your uh, network set up at home, Jim. I'm waiting for it from uh, the state of Michigan so we can get that all set up. I mean, they're the ones that said, hey, you can't meet. So I think they owe us uh, all equipment. You know, I think that'll be part of our capital improvement plan. What do you think? Uh, well, only if the state pays for it, not the city. Uh, okay, fair enough. Matching funds. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, I, I was just thinking as far as, uh, you know, we started the sustainability committee uh, just a couple weeks ago. Whether well, or not that can be brought up mm -hmm. as far as uh, what, what we've discussed and where we're going with it. I think that our next meeting would be a great opportunity to do that. Well, I can't think of anything right. else. To add to well, that. You don't, I don't need to put you on the spot. It's not like you have to decide right this second. We have a couple of months to figure it out. And I know city manager will try to coordinate a date for everybody and um, we'll be planning it before then. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very informative. And I know it's you know, it's difficult for everybody to be here at the same time. I, I think my son pitched, but their team lost. So uh, oh. I guess I didn't miss much, right? So, but anyway, <laughs> anyway. Well, thanks for the education, everybody. It's good. Yeah. Maybe next time we can actually do this live. In person, not live on virtual. I keep voting on that. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> So I brought it up for you. Okay, Mike, I guess, <laughs> I guess Mike can wrap it up. Oh, I mean, we're all done. I, I guess, I don't know. I don't really know if you need an official adjournment from anything. It's just the, someone, I guess. I would say so. We, well, we opened it. They'll make a motion that we adjourn the no, joint no, no, meeting no, no, of no, city council. No, no, no. <laughs> Unanimous consent, just say aye and just be done. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still make the motion. I, I want to stick around. I, I don't want to. Uh, I let's, let's get up out of here before ten thirty. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank, Thank you, you. Ken, again for any. Who's, who's going to second it? Who's going to second it? Hey, we I'll all said I. We I'll second it. I. 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 Thank you all from the. Thanks, CDA, everyone. Bill Kelly. <laughs>